Thank you, Rodney. Um, I'm uh, pleased today that Lucas Mir, our program officer, will be joining me for part of this presentation. But I do want to let you know that we have a great, phenomenal Congolese staff in the Congo. And every year I try to get them a visa to the United States, and it's not possible. I was in Kinshasa, the capital, in August, went to the U.S. Embassy, and trying to find a way for us to get some of our people to be able to come to WCN. But it's just the the number of Congolese people that do not return after getting a visa in the United States is one of the highest, and the U.S. Embassy really is really resistant and reluctant to issue. Even th they've told me stories about somebody vouch for this person. He's a doctor. He's a lawyer. He's the most fantastic person in the world. He's definitely going to come back, and he doesn't come back, and that's one of the issues. So hopefully we'll keep working this in that one of these years, and hopefully next year we're going to have one of our great staff members here to present with us. Uh, the, the title of my talk is about in a crisis zone, and uh, it, it, and people say, is this a war zone? No, a war zone has armies and defined enemies, and this is a place where there's lots of different groups that have no reason to exist but to uh, create chaos for their own personal gain. So it's not a war zone, it's a crisis zone. I, I just want to start today because everybody asks, you know, why are we working with Okapi? And I think some of these facts here just to keep them in the back of your mind is, is the reason we work with Okabe, not because I like them and they're beautiful and they're fantastic and they're mysterious, but only 2% of the global biomass of terrestrial animals are wild animals. 98% of the global biomass are humans and are domestic animals. That's huge. You see on here, n it, rainforests make up 6% of the Earth's surface, over 50% of the species are found there. And rainforests are the most competitive places on Earth. The competition has created on numerous numbers of different remarkable life forms, plants and animals. And to save biodiversity, you have to save forests. It's just remarkable that the amount of life is there. And we're fortunate that the Okapi is the symbol of the rainforest of DR Congo. The, uh, the range of the Okapi is limited to northeastern Zaire. There's a small population on the, this is the Congo River goes through here. There's a small population south of the Congo River. There are evidence that they did once occur into Uganda in the Simliki Valley in this area around the Brunga Mountains. There you did, but they are no longer found there. So it's a unique endemic species to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. This uh, country is the one of the mega diversity countries by CR. It's got the tremendous life. It's the most biodiverse country in Africa. It leads the African countries a number of species of mammals, birds, reptiles, plants, far exceeds them. And Henry Morton Stanley was crossing through here in 1888. He surmised before he was crossing through the Uturi Forest, this must, place must hold the marvels of Africa. That was before mountain gorillas were found and Okapi were found and Congo peafowl, a number of different species in this place that nobody had ever seen before. Uh, this is a rainforest. It's huge. It's the, this is 68% of the tropical forests in Africa are found in DRC, 13% of the global biome. 125 billion tons of carbon are stored in its forests. This is a closed canopy forest in that you really can't see the sky. This is where Okapi live. They're the only ungulate that depend entirely on understory foliage for their existence. So Okapi are kind of unusual in that they're big animals and they, they have great sense of hearing. You see those ears, great sense of smell, so getting close to them. But I always wonder why they were so big. They're, they're six, eight hundred pounds. A lot of forest animals are small. But they have to walk through this forest every day for kilometers and kilometers getting leaves. And I've tried to walk through this forest without a, a pygmy with a machete. I'm not getting very far. And they just, put, they just take their big, strong chest and they just push their ways through the forest, eating leaves as they go. So their size is important for collecting foliage. So we put camera traps out in 2016. And this was the first video of an okapi eating in the wild. They eat over 100 species of leaves and they just walk and eat leaves. A lot of these leaves have toxins, so if they have three or four leaves from one plant, they have to stop and go to another one because the toxins from that leaves, will, if they eat too many, will make them sick. So they're constantly buffering their diets from one to the other. The other unusual thing about Okapi, they live in, uh, in an area of forest where there's a high population of leopards, and, they're, and for millions of years they've co-evolved, so their biology is to avoid leopard predation. The Okapi communicates with infrasound, listen. So this is an infrasound recording boosted to our hearing range. But we can hear it. And this travels below our hearing range and that of leopards. So it's, it's, it's how Okapi communicate in the forest, the young and to each other through this dense. Forest elephants do this, also black rhinos and several other forest species that have to communicate. 
And the young are, are born quite small. They get into a nest, and they get in this nest, and they stay in this nest for two to three months, just coming out to nurse four or five times a day. The mother will never go near the nest. She uses infrasound to call the baby out. The baby nurses and goes back to the nest. This way, the chance of a, a leopard finding this baby are very slim. And the baby does this. They don't defecate for 60 days. They don't create any. The muconium, the first defecation, normally in mammals, is in one day, 60 days. So this is the, not to bring any scent to itself when it's really vulnerable. They grow very fast. The mother has very high fat milk. And for a big animal, by, by six, eight months, they're three quarters grown. That's to get above the level that, prey, that the leopards can prey upon them. So the okapi is an old mammal species. They, have, they lived in Africa for about seven million years, and they went undiscovered undis by Western science until 1901. And that's when the first okapi skin was identified and went to zoological London. And it was, uh, this was a giraffe species, a forest giraffe. It lived in a rainforest, quite unusual. And guess what Western science did? The first thing we do, we have to collect for all our museums. And this is a museum in Paris. Every museum had to have this, un this animal. And what I think, this is an animal nobody imagined existed. So you can imagine the excitement about this animal when it first discovered, how can an animal like this live in the middle of the rainforest looking like this? And so people had to have it. Uh, because of the demand for zoos, the first animal went to Antwerp Zoo in Belgium in 1919. The first captive birth was 1957. So it took a long time to figure out their biology in the zoo setting. The Belgians monopolizing the country of Belgian Congo set up this Pulu station in the middle of the Turi Forest. And this was a place where they had okapi that they distributed to mainly to uh, Antwerp and Belgium, their own zoo. And then this was from there they went to the zoos of the United States and the rest of Europe. In uh, 1961, at the, in Independence, this station was destroyed during the Congolese uh, in independence from Belgium. And it left abandoned. And so in, in 1987, we had a contract with a country, uh, the country of Zaire at the time to rehabilitate the station and to bring awareness of, a, of the Okapi to the Congolese people and to the world. Uh, this the site, this uh, station was really meant to set up to, to showcase the Okapi uh, to the people and to the world and also to encourage tourism and to create this center which was known for a long time in, in Congo. I went to I went to the Congo because of the Okapi, but I fell in love with the people and the place. The Muti Pygmies are phenomenal culture, caring, loving, friendly, and just amazing people. And the, well, working with the Okapi is really important because in Congo it's very important. It's been protected since 1933. It's a symbol of their national parks and their protected areas on the patch from one of the rangers and the, and the Institute in Congo for the Conservation of Nature. So this is very important that you know, we want to conserve this animal in the West, but we don't know much about it. And people come to our table and never heard of an okapi. That's one of the most comments we ever heard. You can go to any two or three year old kid and above in Congo and they'll tell you what an okapi is. They can show you an okapi. And the reason is because okapi are everywhere. You know, okapi waters, okapi construction, okapi cigarettes, okapi logistics. Well, radio okapi is the number one news source in DRC, print, media, and radio and in internet. So it's really well known. So it's, it's to build awareness and uh, to, to have people care about this animal is not that difficult. And that's what we need is we have to build a critical mass of people caring about it. We started this project. No area for, was uh, set aside to protect Okapi. So in 1992, uh, the Okapi Wildlife Reserve was created with the help of partners. And that, at that, that time, the government of Zaire is 14,000 square kilometers, about the two, one and a half times the size of Yellowstone National Park. And it's a tremendous forest system, 150 of Turi Forest in, in Africa. It not only protects the Okapi, it protects the Mbuti uh, pygmies' way of life. They live and need the same as the Okapi. Another remarkable thing about this area has the greatest, highest population of chimpanzees, forest elephants, buffalo, and Okapi in the whole country of DRC. It's actually a, uh, the largest density of primate species. 17 primate species occur in this forest. I was in there when I was there in uh, May and June. I looked up one one day, and there were six different species of monkeys in the trees above me, and not just one. There was large groups of six different species, which is really unheard of when you see that kind of diversity in the forest at different trophic le levels. Some in the lower in the tree, middle of the tree, high in the tree, some on the ground. Just amazing. So the Mbuti pygmies share the forest uh, with the, with uh, Okapi. They've been in this forest about 40,000 years. These are the smallest people on Earth. The men are about four feet inches tall, the women about four feet three inches, and these are net hunters. They hunt their game by stringing nets between trees and have their dogs and women and children drive the game to the nets. You see the man here with a spear. He's, the animal hits the net, 
they spear it, it's usually small dike or small antelope. Oh, copy are too big, they go right to the nets, the buffalo go right to the nets. So it's usually the small game that they're after. And I've been on hunts with them and they kill one animal, done. Roll up the nets, go back and throw the animal, just take the whole animal and throw it on the fire. And that's what they do, that's how they, they just, they're, they're subsistence hunting, they only hunt what they need, they have no refrigeration, they have no way of keeping anything fresh. So when you have enough to feed the village, you stop. There's nothing else you can do with the food. These are nomadic, uh, uh, moving through the forest as nomadic hunter-gatherers. They set up a camp like this. And this is important for Okapi because they're the, at this camp for a couple months. When they leave this camp, all the tree shoots come up from the ground. And this is forage for Okapi and Bongo and other forest dwellers because this is a clearing in the forest they made, but they're only there for a short time and then it recovers. So this is a natural mosaic. The, the trees are too tall for Okapi to feed in most of the forest. You need tree falls, you need clearings, you need openings to create the food for the Okapi they can reach. So we have two pillars to our program. One is protection of the land. The other is working with the communities to create a, sensi a sensibility about protecting the forest for the Okapi. The ICCN is the government agency responsible uh, for protecting the, uh, the forest of this reserve. The government does not have enough money to pay them, so we pay them. Getting around is very difficult. The rainforest, it rains a lot. And then roads get muddy, they get impassable. Uh, the infrastructure is not, in, not very well maintained, so regularly overloaded trucks will take a bridge out. And sometimes this could take, you know, three months repair, sometimes a year. So we have little barges set up bringing everybody back and forth across the river in the meantime. So our support for the range is very critical. These are whole, all Holden Thraya satellite phones for communication. We provide their base salary, their health care for their families, their rations on patrol, and their bonuses. And the bonuses are important because we have to motivate. This is a dangerous job. It's a very dangerous job. There's men out there with guns. They're, they are in this forest. How do you get people to go out into this forest and risk their lives? First of all, they're very brave and they're very dedicated to their jobs. And, and by the second thing, they get paid by the days in the field, how many snares they collect, how many weapons they collect, how many arrests they make. So this motivates them. And the Thraya phones send out signals where they are. They send back to headquarters. So everything's recorded so we can pay uh, the guards appropriately and motivate them to be out there. This is some of the statistics uh, for the rangers. We have about 85 rangers that can patrol the reserve, and we have uh, a, a, an issue with seven patrol posts in which they go, and you can see they walked 15,130 kilometers last year in the, on just on patrol, and this is each patrol. Each patrol is about four or five rangers and a porter. Uh, 2015 class of ranger, we had four women. These are our first four women rangers. They're still on the job. They're still working hard. I was there, they're tremendous. <laughs> And, and we're in the process of training 50 new rangers right now, and we're trying to get more women to join on this next recruitment class because these four did a great job, and I think they're a great example for the other women. There's very little jobs for women, and this would be a good job for them because we, we, besides the patrols, we have checkpoints along the road, other places they can actually be very helpful in protecting the wildlife along the road and other issues. This is a conflict zone, and, you know, it's, it's very hard to to picture this till you're there because everything looks pretty normal till it's not. And that's just what a conflict zone is. It looks normal, then it's not. Gun bullets start flying. You don't know why, where, where it's coming from. This just happens. A lot of these groups just have no reason but to just create chaos. For that way, they allows them to undertake their illegal activities by creating chaos. So it's really a difficult situation. This little cute bugger here is a cause of a lot of the problems we have in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. That ivory is forest elephant ivory. It's denser than savanna ivory. It's worth more than savanna ivory. It's very sought after, and, it's, and the, the, the poachers are heavily armed, and this is something that the, a lot of the politicians and corrupt military officials are involved in directing these poaching games or ivory. So it's, a, it's more of a political minefield as well as a dangerous place in the forest op occupied. Snaring does occur on Okapi. Uh, there is occasion we, we get an average of maybe two, three skins a year. We confiscate in different areas, not just in reserve, but in the huge area around us. But collect, picking up snares is the, is the way. Okapi get accidentally snared. That's the only way they usually probably die is accidentally snared. And so picking up snares, walking is the best way to protect them. Uh, in our area, we're, so, I would say, somewhat fortunate. Only about 15% of the snares are wire. About 85% are rope and twine, and Okapi can break them. 
So it's the, the wire snares are the more dangerous snare for okapi, buffalo, and other large animals. Mining is our, one of our more serious uh, issues right now. This is an area that's phenomenal how much gold is in the ground in this area. When Mobutu was dictator, he had this as a mining zone, and no people were allowed in this whole area. We created the reserve. It was actually pretty easy to create the reserve because nobody was allowed because they, they knew there were so many minerals. So this is an open mine. Uh, the issue with mining is the miners and uh, the middlemen that process the go are, are come to live in the forest, and they have to eat. And that bushmeat trade will just, just uh, explode around these mines. So the way to control bushmeat is to close the mines. Uh, over 15,000 miners have been evacuated by the range over the last couple of years. We have a, a pretty, I would call, uh, on purpose, very fair uh, system for removing miners. The first time they're just removed, you know, out, if they come back, then their goods are confiscated. If they come back the third time, they're arrested. So really, we don't want to create an enemy. The miners are just poor people trying to make a living. And that's, we know that. They come from far and wide. The idea is we want them to go back to where they came from, not stay here. You can mine lots of places outside the reserve. Just don't want you to mine inside the reserve. So the system, we've had not conflict about this, but the people that are on the, in these military, semi-military groups, they try to get money from all these miners, and that's how it is. Uh, the, we talked about this a few times. We've been here, people. We had a very bad attack on our station in 2012, and this was in retaliation to the good job the rangers were you know, arresting poachers, closing down gold mines, and the, the Mai Mai militias that were involved there retaliated, attacked the station, killed the people, killed well, copy we had the station. But I have to say we've done a great job with support from our donors, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. All the facilities have been rebuilt. This is the headquarters for ICCN. And then all tourist facilities, say everybody says, well, how can you have tourism? Well, you know, we can't have tourism, but it's important to have the potential because the communities get 25% of the revenue from tourism. We have to show them that this is a serious uh, occurrence that could, uh, could happen in the future, and we want to make sure of the facility. We do have some tourists that come through, very brave ones now and then, but we have the facilities. Uh, we have guard posts around the reserve. Zungaluka Post is on the eastern part. It's the eastern entrance to the reserve. It's the one of the most important ones. This was attacked in January 2015 and destroyed. We rebuilt all the guard housing. We built a new, just finished a new uh, guard office, and this is an immigration checkpoint. This gate is very professional. The rangers are very professional. We want to give this a, a pro when people come to this room, we've got to realize this is well managed, it's well operated. So having really nice facilities is important to send the message. There's people here who know what they're doing. Uh, since the uh, last issue we had in the, in, in the reserve, we've had great securities improvement. Just uh, this is, I was there in May and June just recently after the British tourists were kidnapped in Virungas and they were ransomed and released. And the government was really worried about me being there. So I had an armed vehicle in front of me. You can see this vehicle here. These are Congolese soldiers, heavily armed. And this is uh, these Indoro cattle coming down from CR, which is another problem. But you can see the ra these are two rangers, how heavily armed they are. So we got heavily armed rangers. We have army people. And uh, the issues in reserve have been really brought under control. They, the army has really made uh, an effort to arrest poacher. And they kind of say that closing mines is not their responsibility. They don't, that's not their responsibility. That's the rangers' responsibility. But poaching, people that are killing animals, that's their responsibility. So they've been going, and they've been, I talked to a few of the colonels there, and they've been getting people, they've been arresting people, they've been doing a good job. The other pillar of our program is community. We have 50,000 people living around this reserve that have to eat, have to take care of their children, have to educate them, and we have to listen to them. And the reason we provide this uh, we work with the communities because we have to have dialogue with them. If we, we don't have dialogue, we cannot teach them anything. We don't have dialogue, we can't change anything. So working with them and listening to them and, and, and addressing some of their needs. Uh, the, we have uh, four education offices around the reserve from, because the road getting around is so difficult. If you just look at this road, this is our, the guys spend days and days on motorcycles going to 37,000 school children we reach two to three times a year bringing the message of hope and sustainability to them. Uh, we have a protected animal poster program. The Mabuti pygmies can hunt sustainably, but they can't ha hunt protected species. But they don't know what's protected. They've been hunting in this forest for 4,000 years. How do they know what's protected and not protected? To them, they're all the same. But the, if they can see this, you educate and talk to them, they actually do listen and they actually do cooperate because it, they just want paying attention to their needs and also paying attention to what they do for a living is really important to them, so in recognizing their, their rights. Our educators, 
talk to the children and meet the children. We talk about sustainability, forest biodiversity, all kinds of issues with wildlife conservation, and there are, it's a really important program. And the kids, you know, exciting the kids, helping the schools, and uh, our educators work under a principle called children are message multipliers. There's no TV here, there's nothing. The kids come home from school and they just talk about what they learned at school today, and the parents are sitting around, everybody's cooking the meal and sitting around outside playing. There's not, they, they, so the kids talk about everything all the time that they're learning in school. So this is how we get to the parents is through the kids. It's hard to get the parents to come around and listen, but the kids, and they go home and they talk, 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 so it's great for that. So. <laughs> kids are encouraged to interact with the adults, and that kind of is really in this culture. It's really great. The kids can interact and say whatever they want to say. It's really nice. So the reserve is a reserve. It's not a national park. No people were moved out to create this, so we have zones for certain activities. The light color are agriculture zones, the tan color are Mbuti sustainable hunting zones, and this is a central zone which no human activities are allowed and the all, animal, all wildlife is protected. That's recent, over the last four years we created a central zone with support from the communities. Uh, agriculture, slash and burn agriculture overall is the most threatening thing to all wildlife in the forest and especially to Okapi. No trees, no Okapi. No trees, no elephants, no chimpanzees. So the communities develop these agriculture zones. We work with them, they design them, they lay them out, we protect them. There's blue markers going through the forest, setting off forest zone on one side, agriculture zone on the other. And these are very effective because the community is involved in doing that. And this is agroforestry is how we help them. This is a way we give them uh, ways of crop, re crop rotation, new crops, and these are lucerne trees between the rows right here. They're nitrogen fixing. So the problem with rainforest soils, they're very, they're very impoverished. One year, uh, you've got to move on. Two years at the maximum you get. Now you can get doing this five to seven, eight years in the same plot of land, and you can come back to it in one or two years instead of 15 years. So this really reduces the need to cut forests to grow food. They can grow more food on less land and do it for a longer period of time. We have uh, tree nurseries. We have five of them. Two of them were supported by WCN donors the last couple of years. And these are native trees we grow and give to farmers. Uh, last year, 50. Our goal this year is 60,000 trees delivered to farmers to be planted uh, for fruit, nuts and tr uh, fruit trees, also rainforest trees around the schools. And uh, women are important. They're our biggest stakeholder. Women re are responsible for getting the resources, the firewood, the water, the food, maintaining the household. You have to reach the women in power. This woman has 10 children. And you see, she doesn't want to have 10 children, but she has to have 10 children. Somebody has to get the firewood, has to get the water. Somebody has to clean the house. Somebody has to watch the other kids. Someone's got to help cook the food. That's why they have a lot of kids. They need the help to survive in this environment. So we have women's groups that try to empower women to have a sustainable income. Uh, these women's groups have, uh, we provide them with sewing machines for cloth and they, and they sell these in the market. They do, a number of our women's groups have the contracts to make school uniforms, two sets of uniforms for each kid in the school, 37,000 kids. That's a lot of uniforms. So this is a really good source of income. Uh, right now we're just finishing this new building. This is for the women's group to meet in because they usually meet outdoors and if it's raining they can't meet. This way they can meet, do their sewing, do everything like that. Uh, they also have, they do cooperative farming, which is also very important because they can produce surplus crop, crops to pay for school fees and health care needs. Every time we ask the community, what's your greatest need, they always say health care. Health care is their number one concern is health care because the diseases and the deaths and the suffering is really bothers the people. So we support 20 rural health clinics plus a major clinic in Apulu. And clean water is another thing that's very important. About 90% of human diseases can be alleviated with clean water. So we have built these water sources again with help from WCN donors around the reserve. So I'm going to turn it over now to Lucas who's going to talk about some of the exciting things we do with our camera trap program. And Lucas went over there with me and helped set these up uh, a few years ago. And so he's going to do that right now. So I introduce Lucas Mears, program officer. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Um, so John took up a lot of the time. Um, I will try and uh, make this pretty expedited. Um, but like John said, uh, I went over there with him about a few years ago to go set up our camera trapping program. Uh, and it was a major culture shock. I do travel a lot. I am fortunate enough to be able to go around the world to various places, but this was the biggest culture shock that I've ever experienced in my life. Um, we arrived, went through immigration. That was intense and scary. 
Um, but then everywhere we went, we always had armed guards following us. Every time I went to the bathroom, when we went to bed, there was always an armed guard there just as added security. So this is the habitat that Okapi live in. Um, it's very dense, very difficult to uh, do population surveys. We really don't have much of an estimate on their over over overall throughout their entire um, range on the population, but within the Okapi Wildlife Reserve, there's about 3,500, and it's a relatively stable population. Um, it's rare to actually see an Okapi in the wild. Um, our rangers, ICCN rangers, will walk an average of about 500 kilometers before they see their first glimpse of an Okapi, and this is typically what they see, a blurry animal that's walking away, and that's it. Currently, the population estimates are done via dung counts, and Rodney was actually talking about the benefits of uh, collecting information from dung counts. You can also get population estimates and determine the, the density of the species, but it's long, laborious, exhausting, um, and you have to have that security, that added security with the armed guards with you to do these surveys. They could take months, months at a time. So what we did a few years ago was um, bring camera traps over. We actually, because of the difficulty of getting into the country, we actually have to um, sneak the camera traps in a little bit. Um, and so we would hide them in our t-shirts and stuff to bring some over. So we only have about 25 camera traps over there now, and every time we go over, we bring a few more. Um, so we trained our Congolese staff in um, setting up these camera traps, and they had a blast walking in front of the, the camera traps, acting like Okapi. Uh, it was quite hilarious. Everyone was laughing, having a great time. Uh, and it did take a few trial runs to actually get the cameras up and running. Here's our team Okapi. This is our team that actually goes out and sets up the camera traps. We typically have a few armed guards for the added security. Um, we have a, a pygmy guide and then two of our uh, Okapi Conservation Project staff that actually help uh, set up the cameras. We have the added security with the guards. Um, the pygmy shows are, is, is the, are the ones looking for Okapi signs and we set up the camera traps where we actually see signs of Okapi like dung. But once the camera traps are set, we can leave them. Uh, and then they just collect the data every time something walks in front of them. And so about every week, we have uh, uh, pygmies actually check on the camera traps to make sure that they are functioning, that they're not stolen or anything like that. Uh, so here is a uh, pygmy woman actually explaining to someone off camera how a camera trap works. So they're actually sharing that message of, of the whole camera trap study, carrying a little baby. Uh, and so we first started off with getting still images. And this is an image of two Okapi together, which is very, very rare. We think that this, uh, the one in the back is a, a young male, and we believe that this is his mother. Um, he has not been weaned fully off of her yet. Um, but it's very rare to see two Okapi together unless it's a mother calf pair or if um, they are mating, if it's a male female. We'll also get unique identifying um, marks. Um, each Okapi has uh, stripes that are identified by, um, or their individual unique patterns, just like our fingertips. But this one here has a leopard scar, you can see that. Adults can typically escape uh, leopard attacks because they'll just charge through the forest and the leopard falls off, whereas calves will actually um, succumb to them and actually be, be killed. Uh, and then we recently went into um, collecting video footage. So I have a, a series of 10 to 20 second clips. Um, and this is typically what we get in Okapi standing, <laughs> chewing, and that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. Um, but then here you'll see a unique, they're very sensitive to sound. And so she heard something and then darted off. And here's something very, very special. This has never been documented before. Um, here we have a female Okapi walking in front of the camera trap. And then if you look at the timestamp at the bottom, just four minutes later, there's a male following right behind. Female are only in estrus for a few days, and so they have to mate during that period of time in order to, to get pregnant. And then you can see her distended abdomen. Here's a pregnant Okapi, just chewing and eating as they always do. Um, there was at one point where I was analyzing our camera trap footage, and I think I had three hours of a single Okapi standing in front, and it was just like twitching, <laughs> and that just kept setting off the camera trap. <laughs> and so I had three hours to analyze. But <laughs> yes, it, but I did get some uh, unique behaviors. Um, so what do you hope for after you see a pregnant Okapi? Yes. So in early February this year, we captured the first ever video of an Okapi calf in the wild. 
Ah, oh, they're miniature version of the versions of the adults, and they're the most adorable things in the world. They um, are born with a little mane down their neck, um, and they lose that as they get older. They are the fastest growing ungulates in the animal kingdom, um, and the female will increase her, her feeding by 50%. She'll eat 50% more leaves because she's actually um, giving the uh, nutrition, the nutrients, and the fat to the baby to, to help them grow much faster. We were also able to collect a lot of symbiotic behaviors um, and if you see, here's the okapi, you'll see little birds down here um, once the okapi starts moving. This is a symbiotic behavior that's never been documented with okapi before, similar to uh, how cows or cattle will walk through uh, uh, the plains or any other hoofstock. Um, there's the bird. Um, we'll stir up insects, and so the birds start feeding on the insects. But then we also get a lot of inform or information of other animals that share the same habitat. Okapi Wildlife Reserve is home to about 4,500 um, individual chimpanzees. It's the largest population of chimpanzees in the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then we also get forest elephants. This was the first video of forest elephants ever uh, captured in the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. And there's a little surprise at the end. I think I just ruined it. Little calf. Aww. Pretty adorable. And so then you get other unique species like bats. I just wanted to share this because bats are cool um, and you wouldn't expect to get them. They just happen to land on that branch right in front of the camera trap. Oh, and then one day we noticed that all of our pineapples were missing in our garden. <laughs> we decided that this guy can keep the pineapples. We don't want to, he did leave the eggplants though. And so what do we do with all of this information? First and foremost, we share it with the communities because the communities are the, they are our biggest partners and the most important part of this whole project. Um, because they, Okapi are so reclusive and secretive, the local people never see them in their native habitat. So we share this footage with all the local people to instill inc excitement, passion for their national animal. Um, it's kind of like their bald eagle. Everyone knows what an okapi is, like Don was saying. Um, we also use it to collect data, to get baseline um, population data to understand densities. But we also want to share this with the world. Um, and so we created World Okapi Day in 2016, and it's on this coming Thursday. Mark your calendars. And so we first started by reaching out to zoos around the world that actually house okapi, because typically you can only see an okapi in a zoo because they're so secretive and it's so difficult to get into DRC. We are selling these shirts at our table if you want some okapi stripes. <laughs> and then last year we actually expanded into the reserve um, and we actually had um, zoos around the world sponsor individual villages within the Okapi Wildlife Reserve. And sport really resonates with people. Um, so we recruited, um, we worked with the schools to select people um, to compete in sports. Uh, and we held races in four villages around the reserve. And this year we're expanding to five villages. It was so popular the first year, we, um, there were about 15,000 people participating and watching all of these races. It was a much bigger turnout than what we expected. Um, and we are expanding it even more this year. And I'm gonna pass it on to John to close. Sorry. <laughs> So that's, you know, working there is, is difficult, but the okapi has been classified as endangered, and, it, and its decline it just parallels the, the civil disorder in the Congo. In 1997, we probably had 40, 50,000 okapi. Today, maybe 10 to 15,000. The decline just parallels the lack of civil order and the lack of ability to protect okapi across this range. So this has helped us get the word out, and we've actually been able to use the endangered status to help increase our number of grants we can apply for. But the working with the okapi has allowed us to, you, it's a flagship for the area, but also it allows for a unique human culture to thrive and also for unique species, the pangolins and other animals that are protected under the umbrella of this Okapi Wildlife Reserve. Uh, just in closing, and say not all doom and gloom. This is uh, President Kabila burning ivory. And just a quick story, I know we're running out of time, but I was, <laughs> cut it off, but I was just saying, I, w I saw all the ivory in the, in the head of ICZN's office, and he was showing me all this ivory, he had confiscated, I said, why don't you burn it? He said, I'll mention it to the president. He mentioned it to the president, and then two weeks later, it's President Kabila burning ivory for the world to see. And it's a good, good statement for the country to start like that. So. <laughs>